it's Lily. Today I would like to share with you how I create this optical illusion mixing mild steel and copper. I'm going to try to explain as clearly as possible all the different processes that I went through to get to that point. Enjoy! So I started this project with a little sketch on a piece of paper. Once I was happy with the sketch, I used an X-Acto blade and I cut some pieces out. This white template is the one I've used later on in the tutorial to cut the Maya steel sheet. Now with that first template done, I focus on the second one. For that, I apply a sheet of tracing paper over it, cut it roughly to size and tape it in place. And I start to do the second sketch and I was overlapping it. So the idea was to create a pattern that can easily go above and under. And I had to be very careful where I was putting my lines for it to actually work. Once I was happy with the pencil line, I went over it with a marker pen. Then I removed the tracing paper, tip it back onto my cutting board and use the X-Acto blade to cut the pieces out. Now I could position both templates on top of each other and see if they make sense together. If I can have pieces that's going to go under and above without restriction, it needs to make sense both together, not just as a single template. I remove the tracing paper and I start to work on the white templates. I've applied some aluminium wire because it's super soft and easy to bend, three millimeter thick, and I try to roughly follow my initial design and use some duct tape to hold it in place. Now I wasn't trying to do something pretty, I was just trying to get some kind of wire attached to my initial template. Flip the pieces over, cut the extra bits of tape with the X-Acto blade. And now it starts to get interesting because I can actually shape and sculpt my piece of paper. And that gives me a much better sense of what it's going to look like when it's in metal and I can actually forge it and shape it. I went back to my other template that I apply on a piece of card. I happen to have black, but any contrasting color can do the job compared to the previous piece of paper. Remove the template, cut it out with the X-Acto blade. And then I can finally position both templates on top of each other and start to see what it's going to look like. The decision at that stage were to define which part is going to go under or above. So I've done a few cuts here and there. I spotted one area that I wasn't really happy with, so I quickly pick up some leftover piece of card, draw a rough template, cut it out, apply some duct tape just to temporarily hold it in place, remove the whole template, reuse the previous offcuts of that exact shape, sketch it out a bit more cleanly than before, cut it out, put it back in, make sure it looks nice, flip the whole piece over, add some duct tape at the back, and that looks a bit better. So I can reposition my template back onto the white template and continue what I was doing previously, defining which part is gonna go under or above. I decided to cut the edges of the black template so that I can start defining once again what's going to go above the white and what's going to go underneath. I decided to sketch roughly the outline of those parts, cut a little trench with the X-Acto blade and slide the piece back in. At that stage I can really start to get the feel of what the sculpture is going to look like. So now let's tackle the metal. I happen to have a big disc of my steel, slightly bigger than what I was planning to cut, but I thought it just uh, happened to be there and it's perfect for me to use. The thickness is just under two millimeter. So before separating both templates, now that I've done all my cuts, that makes it a bit more fragile, I decided to use some frog tape or decorator's tape to hold it gently together so it's not falling apart. I've used the white template, apply it onto the mild steel, copying it out. Because I still have the aluminum wire underneath, I didn't have some nice clean line, but there's nothing I can't fix later on with the permanent marker. Now when it comes to copper, the sheet I've used is 0.9 millimeter thick. I've taped my black template onto it and went over it with a marker pen. At that stage, I thought it would be handy to have those marks lined up to know exactly where to cut. But as I was cleaning out the piece of copper and buffing it later on, I removed the marks, so this stage is not necessary. I've cut my piece of copper with a jigsaw and a metal blade. I've got the same jigsaw for over a decade. It's been through everything. I'm fully aware that technically when you work with copper, it's supposed to have more gentle, so like the proper jewelry so that you use here. 
but it takes forever. And I'd rather use something that I'm comfortable with, such as my Loyal Jigsaw. The cuts are rougher for sure, but I've saved a significant amount of time. Now, obviously in some cleanup, I've used some abrasive grinding stones. Uh, the small one were great to do the initial deburr and cleaning up. And you can see that even though it's copper and softer, it's eating on the stone quite quickly. I switched to another one, which was even better. The shank was wider, so I have to move to my drill to be able to use that bit. The radius of that stone was wider and actually a perfect fit for what I was trying to do. It was really, really handy to smooth all the edges. Attentive to those grinding stones are the drumming wheels. They're great, but they were so damn quickly and you have to change it all the time. So actually working with those stones was better. Even though there are stones and I'm working with copper, you can see by the end of it, when I went over every edges, it kind of eat it up into the stone still, but it actually has created a channel. So by the time I went onto the copper, you can see that it will follow the shape of the stone that's been carved out much better. And it's going to deburr the top and the bottom part slightly. So it actually does the job better when you have the channel that is carved in. And then I've used more abrasive wheel to get rid of the marks, just smooth it up and clean up the whole piece. So this is what it looked like now, a bit better. And once I lay it up on top of the mild steel piece. To cut the mild steel, I need to have a plasma cutter. I've used a Cutmaster 40 from Ishab, which works absolutely fine. I made sure to connect the earth to the table and also connect the plasma cutter to the air compressor, which is huge and is very noisy. In terms of protecting gears, I always make sure I have my respirators on with the filters. I have a pair of really cool goggles, especially for plasma gutter. On my right hand that will be holding the torch, I have some rubber gloves. The other hand also have rubber gloves, but because it's going to be near the torch, I need to protect it. So I put an extra layer with another gloves in leather to make sure it's protected for the extra heat. And my jacket happened to be flame resistant. That helps as well. Now I've started cutting my piece with the plasma cutter. I remember the day that I discovered this tool and I thought this is the most amazing thing ever. It just cut through steel and any kind of metal like butter. It's brilliant. One last thing that I forgot to mention in terms of protecting gears is proper boots. You're obviously going to need some steel toe cap when you work with metal, but ideally make sure they are high rise and that there's no skin showing because you can see where the sparks are going. So protect your skin and it's definitely not the kind of job that you want to do in flip flops. Now it obviously needed a good cleanup. I like to use those mounted stone drill bits because they're really efficient and they are wide. It's the diameter that makes a big difference. I like those very much, but they were off. So as you can see by the end of half of my piece, they're already gone, unfortunately. I've used my blender for knot and vortex, which is always great to clean up the whole thing and go over all the edges to smooth them up. The alternative will be to use some abrasive burr, such as those ones. Those will last a very long time. They're really, really hard wearing. If you're working with the Dremel, you will have a smaller shank. And there's plenty of abrasive burrs or even diamond burrs that you can put in there that would do a nice job. But in my case, I need to have them as wide as possible. But it starts to look like something after a while. So I focus on how I'm going to shape up uh, the piece. I place it onto a sandbag and I start hammering it from the back. And I can see slowly some forms emerging and some movement. It definitely wasn't as soft as copper and that's what I'm used to. So it's got much more resistant with steel, but it's still possible to get some interesting movement and shape out of it. I wanted to push it forward and I thought, okay, let's bring in the torch and see what we can achieve through heat. I've used a big cylinder of propane as well as a massive one for oxygen. Both of them are connected to the torch with some adjustment valve. The combination of both makes the flame hotter than if it was propane alone. And I start firing it up and it looks like it was barely getting hot. It took forever. Once again, I'm more used to copper. So it's a very different reaction. Until one point, I started to see the red glow and I had to move it along the whole piece. And then instead of quenching it, as I will do with copper, I've learned that it's better to just leave it as it is cooled down by itself. Otherwise, if you put it in water, still will just get shocked and give me the opposite result of what I want to soften the metal. Later on, when it was more cold, I can handle it. And I have to say it was much more stiff than what I expected. Usually when you do the annealing process with copper, it's like butter. You can literally shape it with fingers. Still was another experience, 
but I went at it, I hammered it. It was probably a bit softer than before when I was hammering it cold, but it was still very, very hard. But I can still achieve some interesting movement and shape overall. I could see there was a thick layer of oxide over it, so I took my usual tool. With copper, I always use those abrasive wheels, but here they were not getting through. So I've shifted to using my blender to go over it. And even though it was more efficient, it didn't go through all the layers and it was hard to remove the main marks. So then I switched to the flap disc, much more efficient. That was great, but they are more aggressive and they leave some marks behind them. So then I have to switch back to my blender all over again to smooth it up and remove the previous lines. And it started to look a bit better. My apologies for the image being out of focus right now. I brought back my initial template and started to concentrate on which area needs to go below and which is going to go above. So I was focusing on which part of the white template was going below the black template. And once I was figuring out which area it was, I put my finger on it, took a piece of rubber, because if you hit it with a metal hammer directly, it will mark it. And because I just removed some mark, I did want to put some back in. So I hammered it with the rubber until I got a shape that feels like it can go under the other template. And I kept at it and went over all the area which should be lowered. Now I was happy with that result, but the whole piece needed still more cleanup before I bring uh, the copper in. A bit more help with the abrasive wheels to get a nice clean plate. Now I was ready for copper, so I make sure I line up exactly my copper over the template, because otherwise it's not going to work. And I patiently line it up really, really nicely, then focus on which part I'm going to need to cut. So which part of the black template goes under the white template. Luckily for me, I've used some green tape, which is visible, so I can spot straight away where I need to cut it. And I use a marker pen to mark up the line in each area that will need to be cut. Now I wanted to have a nice clean and thin cut, so I've used my jewelry saw. I thought I'm gonna do things properly. And I did brought my jewelry saw to the workshop that day, but I forgot the replacement blade. And you might see where I'm heading with that. Yes, of course, the blade broke in the first cut. So I was like, okay, that's great, rookie mistake. Didn't have a replacement blade, but I had to move to plan B, which is using the Dremel with some cutting wheels. It did the job really well and quickly, but I had some wider cuts and this is going to bite me in the bum later on, as you will see. But for now, with all the cuts done, I can position my copper plate back and start to slide it under the mild steel. And I love the fact that it's copper because you can see I can bend it, stretch it, and I would not have been able to do this amount of flexing with a mild steel. So that's why it was important to get the copper plate as a top plate. This is the only one that I can shape to get in there. One little part was flying around and needs to be held properly. So I use a clamp and a bit of rubber because otherwise the clamp will mark the metal. And the last thing I want is to get rid of more marks on my metal. Now, before welding the real piece, I always like to take my time and play around with some offcuts in copper and my steel of the same thickness that I've used for my sculpture. The rod is 100% copper and I always make sure I have my respirators on. I've done my little test, adjust the torch so I have the right heat and I've started to do the welding at the back. It's always better to start where it's not going to be seen. If you make a mess, nobody will know about it. Doing some welding at the back was the easy part. I've used some weight to add a little bit of pressure on the pieces to make sure they are tight against the mild steel. The tighter, the better for the weld. And I started to get much more complicated when I try to build up the bridges in copper. Now, really thin sheet of copper like this, when you approach with the tool, the first thing they want is to melt away. And I try to do the opposite of building them up to build this little bridge. And I end up with gaps that sometimes is like one, two millimeter. It doesn't sound like much, but it is a huge amount with those really narrow, thin piece of copper. And I end up having to feed lots of rod to just build it up. And I end up being massive blobs and a mess. And looking back, I just wish I put underneath a piece of aluminum, just underneath that bridge. So it will stop the blobs of copper of falling through because I ended up with massive blob to remove. I had to bring the Dremel with the abrasive burr. It wasn't looking great. At that stage, it was not looking the prettiest, but it was holding together and the weld were sound. So it took much more cleanup to do with different abrasive wheels 
and this is what it looked like by the end of it. Much more happy with it. Last but not least, I've used some acetone and give it a good clean throughout. And then use a crystal clear matte sealer, apply a first coat, leave it dry for an hour and apply the second coat. And there you have it, the sculpture is finished. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video, that it was somehow helpful or useful for your own project. I've been busy this week at the forge, sweating like crazy, hammering some steel, and I've got some nice project coming up next. So see you very soon. Bye bye.